The Whistler. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Whistler's strange story, The Stolen Chance. They made an impressive couple as they moved in perfect rhythm around the crowded dance floor. And no one was more aware of this than Charles Vaughn himself. He liked to think of it that way. He and Edith as perfect partners. And he hoped that it would go on and on. That there would be much more than country club dances and cocktail parties for them to share. What are you thinking, Charles? That you're beautiful? Uh, that I could go on dancing like this forever? Why don't we? Uh, you know perfectly well. I have to be on the show right now. Ah, Charles. There's something I'll never understand. What? How can you tie yourself to the dull routine of a drastical's table when you... Don't need the job. <laughs> I mean it, Charles. You wouldn't want me to be a playboy, would you? Yes. No. You don't mean that. No, I'm sorry, dear. It's something that, well, it's just part of me. A drastical's table? No, it's more than that. Oh. I'm teasing, Charles. It's only that... Oh, we could do so many things together. I know. And we will, Edith. I promise. <laughs> well, dear, it's really time for me to be leaving now. I... Charles, it's the last day. Oh, I'm sorry, but it's late and, and I have what? To... Are you going to turn into a pumpkin? Oh, what is it, Charles? Why are you always leaving early when we go somewhere? I told you, Edith, my work. Oh, it's, your it's... work? But, Charles, I'm supposed to be a very attractive girl. You're not at all flattering. But you are, You darling. leave early. You never let me drive you home. Well, I'll take a cab again, dear. I don't want you to do bother no you. do no such thing. I have a perfectly good car and a chauffeur. I'm driving you home. All right, Edith, if you insist. I do. Right after the last dance. So this is where you live, Charles. This is where I live. Well, at last I discover the lion's lair. Mmm, very nice. It's comfortable, Edith. <laughs> the best apartment in town, and he says it's comfortable. I really must go in, Edith. I'm meeting Gerber early tomorrow. Gerber, and I... Gerber, Gerber. Must I always hear about that man? Well, he's a very brilliant man, a, a great, great aviation engineer. <laughs> oh, you knew how often you said that. I'm sorry, but really, Gerber no is. No more the... Gerber for baby. Kiss me. Mm. Good night, Charles. Good night, dear. Well. Call me tomorrow? Don't I always? Always. Good night, darling. Yes, Charles, you always call Edith, but mainly because you don't want her calling you. You watch as her big car moves away from the curb and rounds the corner out of sight. Then you turn, glance toward the fancy grilled entrance to Grosvenor Arms. For a moment you stand there, thinking. Then start walking slowly, breathing in the crisp night air, enjoying it until you reach another neighborhood. It's a strange thing about New York, isn't it, Charles? How a few short blocks can make such a difference. The thought is turning over in your mind as you enter the hotel where you really live and move up to the desk. The guy sidles up to me and starts into that routine about doing some important work. <laughs> important work, there, that's a laugh. Yeah, and I tell him, if he don't pay... Uh-oh. Well, if it ain't our Mr. Vaughn now. 
And what can I do for you, Mr. Vaughn? You can give me my key. That is, if I'm not interrupting an important conversation. <laughs> Get him, Sammy. He wants his key. <laughs> yeah, and after what you Look, just Look, I telling... said I want my key. I live here, remember? You lived here. We don't carry nobody on the books for All right, all right. You're going to bring up the subject of the rent. I told you I'd pay tonight. Only you got some excuse. I've got the money. If you just give me time to give it to you, here. 30, 35, 37.50. And I want a receipt for it, too. Hmm. I now believe in Santa Claus. <laughs> just put the receipt in my box and give me the key. Sure, sure. But next time, try being on time. Don't worry about it. Oh, sure, I know. Because you're getting that big promotion. Well, I still want to see the cash. Look, you're paid up through the week. Simply because I'm a few days late once in a while. Once in a while, he says. Wearing $80 suits, but he's always late paying for an eight-buck room. <laughs> yeah. What a way to live. Yeah. What do you know about living? Maybe nothing, but I know a four-flusher when I see one. <laughs> Yes, Charles, the hotel where you really live. A frightening contrast from Grosvenor Arms, but so much more practical under the circumstances. You could never get by with your Playboy masquerade on your draftsman's salary, not in Live Anywhere Else. Only $8 a week, Charles. The rest going for fine clothes, entertainment. All the requirements for winning a girl like Edith Seto. She's everything to you, isn't she, Charles? A beautiful symbol, moving in the world toward which you've always strived and wanted more than anything else. Yes, you have to have Edith, Charles. And you know that somehow, some way, you'll manage it. Only for now, the important thing is the job the two of you are always laughing about, the promotion. Actually, you need that promotion, Charles. Need it badly if you're going to continue towards your goal. And that's why as you enter the office of Alex Gerber the following morning, it's the only thing on your mind. Well, good morning, Charles. Morning, Alex. I'm glad you're in early. I have news for you. Sit down. Oh, what is it, Alex? Did I did I get the promotion? Promotion? What are you talking about? Oh, now, please, Alex, don't joke with me. The head draftsman's job, it's mine, isn't it? Oh, that? No, Charles, of course it isn't. Huh? I told Graham myself that you were too good for the job. I, I believe he gave it to Randy Carr. You... You told him I was too good. Well, certainly. That's junior executive stuff, my boy. You're cut out for bigger things, much bigger. But, Alex, I was... I was counting on it. It means I... Forget it, Charles. Now, don't be foolish. You have creative ability. You'll be head and shoulders above all the Randy cars in the company someday. But, Alex, when? When? Oh, now, be patient, Charles. These things take time. Well, it took years for me. Might be the same with you, but... I... I can't wait, Alex. Of course you can wait. Now, sit down, will you? I-, I want you to look at these figures. Figures? I was right, Charles. It all adds up. My work is finished. Oh, oh, the compartment. Of huh? course, the compartment. Look, Charles, two years of struggling, every spare moment. Yeah, now you've succeeded. Think of it. A pressurized pilot's compartment for supersonic speeds. <laughs> I'll certainly surprise them, won't I, Charles? Yes, you'll surprise them. Well, I'm glad we've told no one. And I appreciate the help you've given me. No, I did nothing, Alex. Well, you were here, weren't you? You listened to me, believed in what I was doing. That's why I'm so sure about you, my boy. You'll do something really worthwhile someday. Someday. I'm afraid it'll be too late, Alex. Huh? What's the matter? Where are you going? I'm not feeling well, Alex. I'm going home. Make make some excuse for me, will you? Well, of course. Please, but... Alex. Sure, sure. Oh, oh, Charles. Yes? I'm going out of town for a couple of days to Williston. I'd rather you wouldn't mention this to anyone. There's no reason for me to mention it, Alex. Thank you. Uh, I'll certainly tell him about you when I make the official announcement. Mm. Thank you, Alex. So there it is, Charles. The final answer to whatever you expected for the time wasted in working with Gerber. You really aren't feeling well as you climb the creaking stairs to your room... Stretch out on the iron post bed. There's too much to think about, isn't there? Things that will never add up like those figures on Alex Gerber's drawing board. A newspaper on the nearby washstand doesn't help your mood, does it, Charles? Particularly that item and picture on the front page. Martin Cross, president of Cross Aviation Company in town for manufacturer's conference. Hmm... You can't dismiss it, can you, Charles? The thought of how much Alex Gerber's discovery would mean to a man like Martin Cross, 
You toss restlessly on the bed, stare up at the ceiling. If only that new compartment was your development, Charles. If Gerber had nothing to do with it. It would be the answer to everything. Everything you've always wanted. Charles, we could do so many things together. We will, Edith, I promise. These things take time, Charles. Be patient, patient. You stare at the wall, thinking, wondering... The words on a faded, embroidered motto seem to leap out at you. A wise man makes more opportunities than he finds. You close your eyes, but the thoughts keep whirling through your mind, crossing one another, contradicting. What are you thinking, Charles? That you're beautiful, that I could go on dancing like this forever. Why don't we? These things take time. It took years for me. It might be the same with you. You get up from the bed... Find yourself drawn to the spot where the motto hangs. A wise man makes more opportunities than he finds. Yeah. Yeah. Hello? I'd like to talk to Martin Cross. Well, this is Mr. Cross's secretary. Well, it's very important that I talk to him personally. Would you be I'm kind of... I'm sorry, enough... Mr. Cross doesn't want to be disturbed. Is there any message? No, I... Yes. Yes, tell him this. My name is Charles Vaughn. Charles Vaughn? I've perfected a supersonic pilot's compartment. I know he'll be interested. You mean you're the inventor? Yes. Yes, I'm the inventor. You have just heard the prologue of The Stolen Chance, another strange tale by The Whistler. The Whistler. Charles, you've decided, haven't you? Decided to make your own opportunity. Your desire for Edith, the rich, exciting world she moves in, has led you into a corner, and the only way out is murder. You've committed yourself to it, Charles. The moment you called Martin Cross, told him that Gerber's invention was yours, and now there's no backing down. You remind yourself of that over and over again as you sit with Martin Cross in his hotel suite, tremble with excitement as he leans back in his chair, nodding approval. If you've really accomplished what you say, Vaughn, you've done an amazing bit of work. Of course, I want my own engineers to go over your plans. Oh, of course, sir. When can I see them? Well, whenever you say, Mr. Cross. Now, uh, uh, about the financial arrangements? Uh... Vaughn. If my engineers okay your blueprints, I assure you there'll be no problem there. A thing like this is worth a great deal to us. As a matter of fact, if you'd be interested in a position with the company... Oh, I'm afraid I wouldn't, sir. I, I've done my work. Oh? Uh -huh. Well, whatever you say, Vaughn. Prefer some sort of royalty basis on the patents? Is that it? Well, uh, providing there's a sufficient advance, yes. I'm tired of racking your brains, eh? You're a young man, Vaughn. Too young to quit. I'm sure you'll be back at it in time. You surely wouldn't want to settle for the life of a playboy, would you? Yes. Uh -huh. Well, what I mean is, uh, well, this has taken a lot out of me, Mr. Cross. I, I, I'd I, like to rest for a while. Take it easy. And then, as you say, I'll probably be back at it. <laughs> I'm sure of it. Well, get those plans to me right away. I know we can reach a satisfactory agreement. Good. It's been a pleasure meeting you, Vaughn. Oh, thanks, Mr. Cross. It's been a pleasure for me. Hello, Edith. Oh, Charles. I thought you weren't going to call. Well, you never have to wonder, dear. Uh, how about dinner tonight? Oh, I'd love it, Charles. Where should we go? Hennessy's. Perfect. What time, darling? Well, I'll, I'll meet you there at uh, 7. Can't I pick you up? No, Edith, I, I have something to attend to. Oh, your work again. Well, all right, Hennessy, seven o'clock. But Charles... Yes? Please don't keep me waiting. Ah, 
And now you're ready, Charles. As ready as you'll ever be for what's ahead. You know that Alex is leaving for Williston tonight. He told you that he plans to be away for at least two days. And that's time enough, isn't it, Charles? After two days, it will be difficult to fix the time of death accurately. You'll have spent most of the afternoon at home and with Martin Cross talking business. You'll be with Edith all evening. All that's important is to reach Alex Gerber's apartment without being seen. And that's a simple matter, isn't it? You enter the building quietly from the alley and walk down to his door. An unexpected surprise. Are you alone, Alex? Oh, yes, of course. Come in, my boy. I, uh, I'm not staying long, Alex. Oh, well, uh, sit down. We can talk while I finish packing. Sorry about today, Alex. I hope you didn't think I wasn't interested. Oh, forget it, Charles. You've been working hard. We both have. Feeling better, are you? Much. I'm taking the plans with me. Only copies there are. Oh, uh, they're on the desk right there if you want to look them over again. Oh, well, uh, perhaps you'd better get them, Alex. I... Oh, sure thing. Well, let's see. They're right here in this drawer, I'm sure. I... It's over quickly, isn't it, Charles? You lean down, make certain that Alex Gerber is dead. Then you remove his watch, his ring, and all the cash from his wallet. It must seem like a simple, deliberate robbery. And you take time to make it look that way. Only one thing more, Charles, the plans and the desk. You take them from the drawer, run over them quickly to see that there are no additional notes of any kind. And that's when your eyes rivet on the carbon copy of a letter. Dr. R.C. Fisher, 214 Hillcrest Avenue, Williston. Williston. That's where he was going. Let's see. Dear old friend... I know you'll want to be the first to hear that I've almost perfected a new pressurized cabin, another step in our fight to break the barrier of supersonic speeds. Your studies of heart and bloodstreams at high speeds gave me the key to the problem, and from there... Good Lord! It's all there, isn't it, Charles? The whole story. You were mentioned as a valuable assistant, nothing more. And the letter is closed with a warning from Gerber. Please, Doctor... Because of the confidential nature of the work, destroy this note and do not mention its contents to anyone, not even Carl. I'm sure you understand my reasons. I only wanted to thank you. Sincere regards, Alex Gerber. In a fit of panic, you crumple the letter into your pocket. It's a terrible shock, isn't it, Charles? Because there's no way out. You've described the compartment to Martin Cross as your own. There'll be no way of denying your story when Gerber's body is discovered and the police are seeking a motive. No way unless... Unless Dr. Fisher, 50 miles away in Williston, is never given an opportunity to piece things together. It's a terrible chance, Charles, but one that you must take. You leave Gerber's apartment as quietly as you entered, walk swiftly away through the alley. Twenty minutes later, you're greeting Edith in the cocktail lounge at Hennessy. <laughs> Right on time, darling. You're wonderful. Would you still think so if I said I almost stood you up? What? Go on, say it. My work again. That's what's causing it, dear. I thought I should at least put in an appearance. We're not having dinner? Well, not together. There's something very important I must do, Edith. Please understand. I can wait. No, no. It might take most of the evening. As a matter of fact, I, I'd like to borrow your car. Let me drive you. I'd rather you didn't. Oh, Charles, sometimes you're positively exasperated. I'll take a cab. You will not. Here are the keys. The car's in the parking lot. Are you sure you don't want me to drop you at home? Oh, no. I'll take the cab, darling. After three martinis, I'm not leaving this place without food. There's still a chance, Charles. All you need is a little luck. You keep telling yourself that as you drive the 50 miles to Williston in Edith's big car. In as many minutes, you're pulling up across the street from the house on Hillcrest Avenue. 214. That's it. You sit quietly for a few moments, thankful for the darkness as you plan your next move. 
You've got to be sure, Charles. A slip-up now and it's all over. You glance toward the house, puzzling, wondering how to get the doctor outside. The words on the faded motto back in your hotel room seem to swim before you. The wise man makes more opportunities than he finds. Yes, Charles, you made an opportunity. Now you must make another to keep it. And then it comes to you. You switch off the lights, walk down to a drugstore half a block away, slip unnoticed into a phone booth, put through a call to Dr. Fisher's house. Dr. Fisher's residence? Hello. I'm calling from the hospital. Would you ask Dr. Fisher to get right over? Just a minute, please. I'll call the doctor. No, there isn't time. It's an emergency. But... Yeah, that should do it. Hurrying back to the car, you hope Dr. Fisher doesn't take time to check the call. But it's a chance you have to take, Charles. There's no other way at the moment. In the car, you wait nervously, a gun in your lap. A few minutes drag by, and then the front door opens. A tall man carrying a doctor's kit comes out, with a woman hurrying along beside him. They start across the lawn toward the driveway. You start Edith's car, back around in the street into the driveway, and then to make certain you've got the right man, you call out to him. Dr. Fisher! Dr. Fisher! What was that, dear? Did someone call? Well, come in, darling. I can't stay, dear. I have to be on the the job right right now. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, Charles, how long are you going to go on saying that? I'm sorry, Edith, but I do have to be at the office tomorrow. And the next day, and the next day. Why, Charles... No, Edith, I don't think so. I'm beginning to feel as you do about it. You're going to quit? I've just finished something. Something rather important, Edith. I don't believe I can do any better. Oh, Charles, I'm very happy for you. For us, dear. We'll be able to do plenty of things together after tomorrow. The Whistler will return in just a moment with a strange ending to tonight's story. Now, back to The Whistler. Almost over, isn't it, Charles? The masquerading, the panic, the terror you've known in making your own opportunities. But it's been worth it, hasn't it? All leading toward the things you've always wanted. Edith and her exciting world. Yes, Charles, it's worth two murders to you. Alex Gerber and Dr. Fisher. And nothing remains to connect you with either of them. It's a surprise when Gerber's body is discovered the next day. But it doesn't matter, does it, Charles? You're in the clear. Ready and waiting for your part in the routine questioning that takes place at the aircraft plant an hour after Alex Gerber's body is found. I understand you worked with Mr. Gerber. Am I right, Vaughn? Yeah, that's right, Lieutenant. We were also very dear friends. And so they tell me. And there's something we can't understand, Vaughn. Oh? This claim you're making that you invented a pressurized pilot's compartment. It's not merely a claim, Lieutenant. I did invent one. I'm in the process of selling the patents. Oh? Well, that gives us the motive... Yeah, the doc's right. What are you talking about? Dr. Fisher's been doing most of the talking, Vaughn. Uh, maybe I better have the doctor step in here. Dr. Fisher, I don't understand. I I mean, I don't know any Dr. Fisher. Would you come in, doctor, please? Dr. Fisher, Mr. Charles Vaughn. What? The doctor says you murdered Alex Gerber, Vaughn. That you did it because he's the one who actually invented the pressurized compartment. Dr. Fisher had a letter from Gerber telling the whole story. Wait a minute, this is... Who are you? 
What are, what are you trying to do? Lieutenant, I'm certain this is the man who shot my husband Jones. last night. You made a mistake, Mr. Vaughn. I suppose it's a natural one. Very few people can get used to the idea of a woman doctor. You see, I'm Dr. Fisher. Let That Whistle be your invitation to listen to The Whistler each week over these stations. This is Ken Nile speaking. Featured in tonight's story were Gerald Moore and Sarah Selby. The Whistler was produced by George W. Allen with story by Gene Levitt and Robert Mitchell. Music by Wilbur Hatch. The Whistler is heard in Canada over the facilities of the Dominion Network of the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.